All right, folks, welcome, welcome to class. Happy Cinco de Mayo. I'm gonna introduce our guest speaker who is going to talk to us about Cinco de Mayo and what it is, what it isn't, give us the correct history behind it. Uh, so really, really happy and honored to introduce to you, Dr. Paul Ortiz, who is the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program and professor of history at the University of Florida. He is the author of An African American and Latinx History of the United States. This is his book. And he is president of the United Faculty of Florida, the UF, the union that represents tenured and non tenured track faculty at the University of Florida. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Paul Ortiz. Um, so happy to have you. I'm going to go ahead and hand over the mic to you so that you can give, give us some really great information and some historical facts about Cinco de Mayo. Welcome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Emanuela, Veronica. It's so great to be here um, uh, all the way from sunny Florida, another state that used to be occupied and uh, tyrannized by the, the Spanish Empire uh, from, Fl from Florida to California, right? And so what I want to talk today about the Battle of Puebla and Cinco de Mayo is really a number of, uh, of overlapping themes that really can be boiled down into three themes. You know, one is that when we think of how Cinco de Mayo was first celebrated by our ancestors and, and the first commemorations, the first records we have of commemorations of Cinco de Mayo were um, where actually veterans of the Mexican army who had, who were now living in California, New Mexico, Arizona, so on and so forth, when they first heard about this incredible triumph of this besieged garrison in Puebla, Mexico, and the word begins to filter, you know, and, and remember back then, you know, you know, there, there isn't even a telegraph line or a phone line to transmit the information. So word travels very slowly. But once Mexicano communities in California and Arizona and others heard about this victory, um, they immediately celebrated. And I want us to kind of go back, kind of put on our historical thinking caps. We have to use our imagination and kind of imagine what it would have been like for a Mexican army veteran who had suffered a terrible defeat when the US had invaded Mexico in the 1840s to hear about this incredible triumph of the people of Puebla, Mexico, over the French imperial forces. And what it meant was immediately, what we understand is that the people commemorating this, again, our ancestors saw the victory of the Mexican forces at Puebla as a triumph of liberty over imperialism and oppression and slavery. And the way they interpreted the, the victory at Puebla is was conditioned by the histories of the Mexican struggles against Spanish imperialism, against slavery, against the oppression of indigenous peoples. It's an intensely personal story within my family. Uh, I'm a third generation military veteran. My grandparents, male and female, fought all fought in the Mexican Revolution. And our even our ancestors going back to the Guamare indigenous peoples fought against the European invaders back in the 1500s. That is after the Aztec empire fell, our people were so called the so-called hill people. Uh, we were not people who lived in cities, but we still fought against the European invaders for decades, for many, many decades. So it seems we've been fighting since time immemorial for our freedom. And I want us to think about the Battle of Puebla as part of five centuries of resistance, five centuries of the struggle against racism and imperialism. And I'm going to do, I'm going to do my, my history prof thing, um, and I'm going to uh, share some slides with you and to kind of help us understand the history of this incredible battle and, and how it was celebrated. Um, Sister Braga actually mentioned my book, African American Latinx History of the United States. And I wanted to just show you the chapter, the, the, the table of contents, because this kind of gives you a sense of how I see the history of the United States 
and the Americas. It's not about Thomas Jefferson or Alexander Hamilton or Washington or all these great things they did for us because they did not. Any freedom that we enjoy today, the right that we have to be gathered together under this incredible instructor uh, who put this wonderful series together, um, those are things our ancestors fought for. Those are freedoms fought and won by blood, sweat, and tears. That this is nothing that was given to us. In other words, this government that we live under in the United States didn't give us anything that we didn't fight for, right? And so that's how I've organized this book. This is a, a history of the United States, but you'll see different time, you'll different events frame the early years. The Haitian Revolution against slavery, which is the great kind of borning mother struggle of all great modern anti-slavery struggles in the United States. It inspires the Mexican War of Independence, which I'll be talking about too, a necessary prelude to the Battle of Puebla. Uh, the Cuban War of Liberation against the Spanish. Uh, and it kind of goes on and on. So I just wanted to give you a sense of how I see the history of the Americas and the histories of our ancestors in struggle and how we're the ones that bring ideas of liberty and freedom to this country. And we have to democratize this country over generations. And every gain we make is, is obviously subjected to, to losses and setbacks. So to understand how our ancestors in, in the 1860s viewed the first word of the victory of the Mexican forces over the French in 1862, we have to go way back. To the, to the 1500s and to understand that the, the brutality of European imperialism in this hemisphere. And those of you who have been to Mexico City or maybe even from Mexico City um, who have seen these murals in person, there's nothing like them in the entire world. It's the Mexican people, Mexican culture who brings this tradition of public arts to the entire world and has inspired public arts movements, um, certainly in the United States and Europe and Asia, Africa, so on and so forth. You can just walk around, you know, you can walk down a block in Mexico City or any small town, you can go to Puebla today and see murals of the Battle of Puebla out of doors. As a historian, I love libraries, right? One of my favorite places in the world is to go, just go to a library and hang out. You know, I love museums. Um, I love to go see lectures. But the Mexican public arts tradition is about getting knowledge and putting it to the people, putting it in the alleys, putting it in the streets, putting it on the street corners, so that anywhere you walk in any of a major Mexican city and small towns even, you'll see these histories and they're painful. They're very painful. Uh, if you study these murals, you should be in tears, you should be raged, you should be angry, but you should also be proud because these murals reflect this incredible resilience and survival spirit. Look at what's depicted here, slavery, the burning, the Europeans burning indigenous people alive, branding human beings. These are the struggles that our ancestors survived so that we could be here today living in relative comfort. And even though we have struggles, we have to understand how far we have come as a people. The Mexican War of Independence is a very important part of the story of Cinco de Mayo. Now, it's very interesting because a lot of my colleagues and, and peers are frustrated because they're like, you know, these gringos get, Mexi you know, get Mexican Independence Day mixed up with Cinco de Mayo, right? And that's true. That doesn't bother me as much because I, I, argument, I argue that there is a relationship between Mexican independence and Cinco de Mayo, and it's right here. This is one of the first, this is actually the first constituent um, constitution that was created by the Mexican people on the move. And what I mean by this is that even before we won our freedom from the Spanish, we were creating, we were imagining what a new nation would look like, a new nation free of European tyranny and oppression and debt. We've never quite achieved that nation yet. We're still working on it, right? But this is an early vision of what that nation could look like, what that emancipated, liberated nation could look like. Number one, an end to slavery and discrimination 
based upon castes. So an end to African and indigenous slavery and oppression. That's what this powerful phrase is pointed to. This goes so far beyond the American Revolution and the so-called Declaration of Independence. That has none of that in here. Torture shall not be permitted. Just to really just think about that for a minute. Think about any other constitution of the time that has that phrase, torture shall not be permitted. And the reason that phrase is in there is because the people of Mexico, indigenous people, mestizos, African people, had been subjected to European tortures for centuries by the time this document was promulgated. Laws should apply to all with no privilege. So I just wanted to give you a glimpse. This is what was at stake during the Mexican War of Independence, 1810 to 1821. So kind of situating this historically, you have the, of course, we know about the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution is much more important than any of those first two. Uh, because it abolishes slavery. And Haiti becomes a beacon of liberty for people all throughout the Americas, uh, Cuba, Argentina, all these, Venezuela. You've heard about the story of Simon Bolivar going with hat in hand to the Haitian people and begging to be taught, how do we defeat the Europeans in battle? Okay, and then the Haitians giving him military advisors and, and, and troops and, and such. And so the Haitian Revolution ends in 1804, the Mexican War of Independence takes off right after that and ends ultimately in independence and the abolition of slavery. Very important. And the people who created and who led the Mexican War of Independence were the most remarkable individuals I've ever encountered in my entire life, um, men and women, because men and women both fought equally hard during those wars but we do have the names, you know the names, right? Jose Morelos is one of my favorite people to talk about because he encapsulates so much of our histories. Uh, he is a mixture, indigenous, African, European. He speaks indigenous languages fluently as many of the leaders of the War of Independence did. This is how they recruited people. Join our army, we're an army of liberation. We're an army that's gonna abolish slavery that's gonna abolish caste oppression of indigenous peoples. The Spanish thought that they wouldn't, that the Spanish were just too confident. They thought, oh, we will crush these people. You know, a bunch of poor uh, barefoot Negroes and poor Indians, that's how the Spanish referred to them as. They gave them no chance of victory. Mistake number one, under, underestimating us, right? Because it's, the, it's a mistake that the French will make again in 1862. They'll replicate the Spanish mistake. The imperialists always think that they're superior mentally, right, physically, and all of these things. They always underestimate oppressed peoples. As the Mexican War of Independence is entering its final phases, people in Mexico call out to Americans, uh, U.S. Americans, to people like President James Madison and say, you know, you all fought a war of independence from these greedy Europeans just a few decades earlier. Join us, you know, join us in Mexico. We could fight, we could create a great alliance against the British and French empires. What a different world we'd be living in today, right? If only the US Americans had the courage and the heart to join with the Mexican people, but the Americans couldn't do it because slavery was too profitable. There's just too much money, too much greed. And so Mexico had to go it alone in this desperate fight against the Spanish. There, I have so many stories about the Mexican War of Independence, Veronica, I have to make sure I get us to 1862, but um, this is one of my favorites. Um, this is one of those folk stories uh, that a lot of Mexican people, especially in places like Oaxaca and others really treasure. Oaxaca is a very important place because it will become a center of resistance against the French in 1862. Um, and there's a lot of, this is the center of black and indigenous resistance to, to the French. But this story about General Guerrero basically telling, uh, basically the Spanish sent his father, they try to get his father to get him to surrender. And he says, I've always respected my father, but my country comes first. This is one of those beautiful moments of lucidity and passion about what it takes to, to bring a nation together. 
Now we're going to kind of move forward. We're going to kind of fast forward in history right now. Um, I know we can't be here forever. Um, and because I'm talking to you from Florida, the Disney state, it is kind of a roller coaster ride of history. Um, but the U.S. invasion of Mexico plays a very important role in what will happen in 1862 in the Battle of Puebla and how oppressed people in this hemisphere, including Mexicans in California and Arizona, view what happens in 1862. So the U.S. invades Mexico, right, in the 1840s. Well, there's several invasions, but the, the so-called, what I when I was a kid, they'd say the Mexican-American War. What is that? That's I, I, And, and they, I still see this in textbooks, unfortunately. No, it's a U.S. invasion of Mexico to reimpose slavery because the U.S. empire finds slavery to be this incredibly profitable engine of growth, okay? The sign you see on top, that's the signs that my elders, my father grew up with having to deal with in Houston, Texas, when he was a busboy in the 1950s. He had to deal with these signs. But I want to take us back further, and what I want us to remember about how racial oppression and racism works, right? Um, and then Frederick Douglass, Douglass, I won't read this quote, but Douglass is explaining why the U.S. invaded Mexico in the 1840s and launched the, 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 the war against Mexico. It's all about slavery. And remember, Douglass is giving this speech, not in the U.S., but in Ireland. In other words, he's talking to another group of oppressed people about how empire works. And I would argue that's how we should be talking today. There is an incredible, amazing tradition of Mexican, Chicano, Hispano, Mexicano, whatever, Latinx, you know, whatever you call us, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Dominican. There's this, these incredible freedom traditions I talk about in African-American at Latinx histories of the United States and that others have documented so well. My elders, people like Rudy Acuna, Vicky Ruiz, uh, Pat Zabea uh, in their histories. Um, we have a proud abolitionist anti-slavery tradition which will manifest itself against the French invasion of the 1860s because what the French are trying to do when they invade Mexico in 1861, 1862, is they're trying to reimpose imperial rule, European control. And there's rumors that they also want to reimpose slavery, okay? That's a rumor, that's something that spreads throughout the Mexican and actually US countrysides. Um, and this is part, but th this tradition, I want us to think about this tradition of Mexicano abolitionism, anti-slavery spirit the spirit of rising against tyranny and against imperialism, right? And so again, I won't read this, but these are critiques of, uh, uh, of, of, of racism, uh, of European style racism. So Francisco P. Ramirez, there's been some really good things about him recently. I juxtaposed him here with Frederick Douglass. They're both abolitionists, right? We're, we're familiar with Frederick Douglass, we should be but we're less familiar with the Mexican, Mexican-American traditions of abolitionism. And we should know much more about that. Mexico abolished slavery decades before the United States did. And this is one of the reasons why the US can't keep its hands off Mexico. This is one of the reasons that Mexico represents a grave threat to Europe and the United States because Mexico develops these freedom traditions of being anti-slavery, these traditions of harboring oppressed people. Even before Mexico gains its independence, they provide sanctuary to African-Americans who, who escape from slavery. And that's a very important story because again, that really angers the United States. Mexico develops so many progressive traditions that we don't give Mexico credit for that lead up to the expulsion of the French. One of them is non-intervention. When I give general lectures to audiences, I'll ask my audiences, how many countries has the U.S. bombed and invaded? And they can't, I mean, we could talk, we could be in that room for hours, right? And then I say, how many countries has, has Mexico bombed or invaded? And people kind of look at me blankly. I'm like, there's a reason. 
because in the Mexican cultural and political traditions in the constitutional histories, there's a strong tradition of non-intervention, of being anti-imperialist, okay? Again, I'm not saying Mexico is without its flaws. Obviously, Mexico has many flaws, right? But there's these incredibly important institutional histories that we can learn so much from, especially in this country, the US, which seems to have endless war. Okay, we're finally at the Battle of Puebla. We made it, 1862. And it is a, um, without trying to give you too much military history, it's a story of strategy, corazón, incredible heart and passion. The French invade with elements of what will become later known as the French Foreign Legion, a fearsome fighting force. Uh, they have many foreign troops who fight with them. Um, it's a highly trained army under Louis Napoleon. Um, and again, the Mexican people are given no uh, chance to defeat the superior trained army. The thing I want to emphasize is that um, the people of Puebla shocked the world. And again, we know that there were men and women who fought in these battles. We need much more research about the women's roles in these battles, but I just want us to remember that, right? And the, the, the battle kind of shocked people because the, the assumption everywhere was that at the end of this day, the French were going to carry the field. Um, the Mexican forces had the high ground, but they had terrible ammunition, guns that was fired. There's a lot of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. That's why I say this is a battle of heart. This is a battle where an army that had superior training lost to an army that was defending its people's homeland, okay? And again, the story of that, of that battle is really, it, it goes on for a day. It involves thousands of casualties. Um, it's really dramatic struggle. Now I want us to kind of, again, put on our historical thinking caps and imagine what this battle meant to people in the hemisphere, um, in Mexico, but in the United States, in Latin America because the news of it reverberate. And this is gonna kind of get us to how the early commemorations of Cinco de Mayo kind of play out. For African-Americans in the United States, this battle was incredibly significant. Remember that the US was fighting its own civil war at the same time. And in fact, historians think this is one of the reasons why the French uh, felt comfortable and confident with going in and invading Mexico. They're, because the French are really trying to reestablish their empire, y'all. They were so humiliated and angry to lose Haiti, to lose the so-called uh, Louisiana Purchase to the other group of, of, of gangsters that took it over, right? And they're, the French are longing for a way to get back into the Americas, getting back into the imperial game, right? Um, they've already launched a bloody repression of people in Algeria and parts of Africa and Asia, right? But they want to get back into the Americas. And so this invasion, that's what this invasion of Mexico is all about. It's about establishing what they call the second Mexican empire. And I want us to think about that word. That's the European term for this invasion is to establish an empire. And so a victory against the French army is a victory against imperialism. So a lot of really good information, you can find a lot of good information about the Battle of Puebla, it turns out, from black newspapers in the United States. They reported on this battle as if it was a battle in the American Civil War. They reported day to day as much information as they could get, you know, about what was happening. The Christian recorder, and again, I won't read this, um, I, I, I can provide anyone um, a copy of the slides that I'm sharing with you, uh, but the Christian Recorder was a black newspaper from the African Methodist Episcopal um, Church. And you can see that they were very excited by Mexican victories over the French, and they followed the French invasion very closely. And you see some, here's a painting of the battle. There are many different paintings of the battle from different, different vantage points. Um, and so there was a lot of rejoicing once it was, it was realized that the French, that the Mexicans had defeated the French in the battle. So I'm going to give you um, so a, a few sources. Uh, David A's Batista Cinco de Mayo book is really, and I'll give you the full citation in a few moments, but 
it's the single best book about how these early commemorations of this battle um, are organized. And they're organized very often by veterans of the Mexican army who were living in California. Let me explain what I mean by this. And so when the US invades Mexico and seizes you know, much of Northern Mexico from Mexico, right at the end of the war, um, basically, if you are Mexican, you are given some, some really bad options. I mean, one is you can stay in the United States and supposedly be treated as an equal, right? Well, that never really happened. But the Mexicans who stayed in the United States, a lot of them are military veterans or, or, or their families. And they have this memory of fighting this bloody war against the United States. So when they and their families hear about the Mexican victory over the French in 1862, they begin to celebrate and they begin to commemorate. And how they celebrated, and I wish we had some photographs from, the, from back in the day, we have some descriptions and they're in Professor uh, Hayes Batista's book, which is a really fine book, by the way. And the descriptions are that the Mexican communities connect the Union struggle against the Confederacy, they connect the anti-slavery uh, struggle, they have banners of Abraham Lincoln. And by the way, in Mexico, there are numerous statues of Abraham Lincoln. I don't know if folks knew this. I didn't know this up until recently, but Lincoln was, was admired. Now he's a flawed character, right? But a lot of Mexican people in the 1860s admired him because what they knew about him was that he was anti-slavery. That's the point I want to highlight because that's how Mexican veterans, military veterans in California, depict or think about Lincoln and the, the American Civil War and the French invasion of Mexico. And remember, a lot of Mexican veterans fight on the Union Army side against the Confederacy in the Southwest, okay? There's some on the other side uh, as well, too, so we, sh we should remember that. But I want us to think about the early, these early commemorations. Again, liberty, the struggle against oppression, the struggle against slavery and imperialism is very much at the forefront of the ways in which Mexican communities on the West Coast, in Arizona, et cetera, celebrate this day. Now, what happens after the Battle of Puebla? Um, we don't like to talk about the, the, the sequel as much because it, it does end in defeat. I mean, the French bring tens of thousands of occupying soldiers. And so eventually they wear the garrison out of Puebla. It falls the following year. But now the war enters a new stage. And this is a stage I would argue is really, really important for our own times. And because now it, now it becomes a full-blown guerrilla war. And to, to understand that, it's almost like if you think of the US war in Vietnam, right? The U.S. had hundreds of thousands of soldiers in Vietnam, and but the Vietnamese people are defending their homeland, right? They're guerrilla fighters, they're irregular troops, right? They're, they're insurgent troops. And this is when the traditions and the histories of Mexico that go back to the Mexican War of Independence and earlier become especially important because these are people who are not going to accept imperialism. They fought these bloody wars against imperialism, right? And so instead of having large armies in the field against the French, you have units of maybe eight or 10 uh, men or women on horseback, and they'll hit a French supply column, they'll hit a garrison, they'll hit a police station, and then just vanish and disappear. And the French would control a lot of the countryside during the daytime, but at night, it was even Stevens. And so these are traditions of fighting that, and, and this is where this history comes up in my family, because I mentioned in the beginning, my family are indigenous peoples with the Gomari who are part of the Chichimecha Alliance against the Europeans in the 1500s. And again, we couldn't fight out in the open against these large you know, uh, ar uh, rifle artillery and, and, and precision mus musketry. So we fight, as guerrilla fighters, right? As freedom fighters, as insurgents. And this, this frustrated the French to no end, right? They wanted, they wanted the Mexicans to come out of these big set piece battles, but they wouldn't. They fought these guerrilla actions. And slowly but surely, and here's another wonderful little vignette in the black newspaper 
the African Methodist newspaper, no less, over 70 guerrilla bands of about 200 men each harassed the roads leading to Mexico City. The renegade Mexicans are rapidly deserting the French. Let me unpack this for us, because what this means is that the French hold down Mexico City. And if you go to Mexico City today, you can see remnants of the French occupation, right? They were trying to, they saw Mexico City as the, the what was going to be the, the uh, what do you call it, the forefront of the second Mexican empire, right? But the French control the city, but they don't control the roads leading out of the city. Those are roads, roads controlled by Mexican insurgents. And the spiritual tradition of Coranderismo, and those of you who know what Coranderismo is, these are the spiritual traditions that kept the resistance in the countryside very strong. This idea that you might dominate us during the daytime, but we have spiritual resiliency that's going to help us survive. And I'm very honored to say that my great grandma Tules was, uh, and is still revered as a curandera who worked on Vance Street and what we called Old Fourth Ward in Houston, Texas for many years. She died shortly after I was born, but people still talk about her as she was still, like she's still alive, like to this day. And the curanderas were primarily women who incorporate the different great cultural traditions, the indigenous traditions, the African, the European, they bring them together. Uh, Rudy uh, Anai's book, uh, Bless Me Ultima, uh, is a wonderful testament to the power of these women who keep their, who they're the leaders of the community. Uh, people are kind of scared of them because they have this kind of spiritual power and they're women, right? Women are supposed to be in the background, but not my great grandma Dulles. She was really the matriarch and patriarch of our family and still is. People still speak of her with great reverence. I just wanted to share this with you because that's what the oral traditions have been passed down in my family, that these are the people who, who helped us survive the worst years, including the years of the French occupation of Mexico. Now, kind of thinking about wrapping up towards the conclusion, um, again, think of these guerrilla insurgent small bands of people on horse and on foot harassing the French, messing up their supply lines, uh, constantly wearing the French garrisons down. And the American Civil War, of course, eventually ends in 1865. And from that point on, small groups, and this is where we need a lot more research, right? But we do know that small groups of African-American soldiers, once they leave the Union Army, once the Civil War ends, they actually go to Mexico to fight with the insurgency against the French. One of the most famous is a man who's considered the father of Black history. Uh, George Washington Williams, who's one of the first African-American historians. Um, I won't read this entire quote, but this is another famous um, African-American um, uh, individual, uh, the Bishop Henry Turner, who is literally the Bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He's living at this time, he eventually settles in Georgia, but he's writing here and he's encouraging people, he's encouraging black people, let's go to Mexico and first, we're going to drown Jefferson Davis, right? He's the president of the Confederate States of, of, of the United States. And then we're going to blow Emperor Maximilian away. Maximilian, of course, is the French emperor who tries to create the second empire of Mexico. And so what this famous Black American leader is saying is, is, is we're going to whip both of them. We're going to, first, we're going to whip Jeb Davis and make sure that he's fully defeated and the, the Confederacy. And then we're going to go and 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 defeat Maximilian. And we're going to, we're going to drive these imperialists out of our hemisphere for once and for all. So this is the book I was referring to earlier. It's a really good text. Um, it has a lot of good information um, about uh, Cinco de Mayo. The one of the things as we kind of move into a closing um, discussion is, uh, and I'll be happy to take uh, questions and answers. I want us to think about ourselves now. I've been talking about historical figures, right? And I've been talking about, you know, giving you a lot of names, places, years, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I'm happy to share uh, the lecture, you know, with you so that you can, you know, it takes a while. This takes many years of study, but I think there's a lot of really good points you can pick up pretty quickly. And one of them is, it, it's a question for all of us here today. How are we going to celebrate and commemorate and remember this day? Um, 
what does May 5th mean to us? What is this battle that took place, you know, well over a century ago mean to us now? My argument has been that it, it demonstrates three things. It demonstrates the, the struggle of oppressed people against tyranny. It demonstrates the passion that our ancestors put into trying to stamp out finally slavery and imperialism. And I've also argued that it's part of these living traditions of struggle that sustain us to this day. They're really, that, that even though we know these are hard times we live in now, the global pandemic, that our ancestors have survived to such an extent that we can learn and thrive today. So my argument here is that Sunga Mai is a living, breathing holiday. In the 1960s, it really gets accentuated in the Chicano movement. On the left-hand side, you say, uh, obviously Cesar Chavez, uh, a strike that the United Farm Workers were taking part in. And the Chicano movement really picked up on Cinco de Mayo because, you know, it's a great story. I mean, this story of, of an underdog defeating the European imperialists is a wonderful story to highlight. Um, and so the Chicano movement really begins to bring back Cinco de Mayo celebrations and commemorations and also tying them to Mexican independence. I've also argued that even though we get irritated that people conflate the 5th of May with Mexican independence, right, that there is a relationship, you know, between the two. But we can't remember, we can't just like kind of think, oh, hey, we've got it made. And so today, I think with, with, with grief and respect to our communities in Houston, where again, where my people are from, uh, which they commemorate Cinco de Mayo a little differently in, in the north uh, part of that community, uh, they gather to remember a police riot uh, against uh, 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 Chicano people that took place in 1976, a police shooting um, of Jose Campos Torres, who was uh, actually a Vietnam War veteran, who was brutally beaten and tortured by the police in Houston. And people to this day come together to remember him. That's his sister uh, in, in, the, in, in the picture, in the caption. What I want us to highlight here is that it's up to us today how we're going to remember and commemorate this, this day. Are we going to simply see it as a history thing or are we gonna incorporate it into our struggles today? Um, I'll kind of close off Frederick Douglass talking about the Civil War and imperialism. And he's arguing here that the US Civil War, this terrible war that cost hundreds of thousands of lives was brought about because the US was so greedy and imperialistic and invaded Mexico, attacked Native American peoples and promoted the slave trade. And Frederick Douglass in 1862 says to, to an audience of white Philadelphians, you all brought this on yourself. How can you be surprised that, that your country, uh, our country, is suffering this terrible atrocity? It's your fault. I, we tried to tell you white people that oppression was wrong. We tried to tell you slavery should be abolished, but you wouldn't listen. Okay, so now this is where, where we've come to. And in conclusion, I want us, I, I love this Matafina Espada poem, Imagine Angels of Bread, because what the po poet is trying to get us to think about here, and he's connecting the Spanish conquest of the Americas, he's connecting the, the Nazi Holocaust, he's, collecting the, he's, he's connecting the story of, of the struggle against slavery and reminding us about the unity of oppression and the unity of struggles and how we have to see these struggles and, and systems of oppression really as connected to, to each other. I think I've talked um, my head off uh, and I thank you for being a very patient audience and I'll be happy to, uh, let me stop the share here. I'll be happy to, to take any uh, uh, questions or comments or thoughts you have. Thank you so much for that presentation. So I'm gonna just uh, kind of remind students here who have, um, who can ask some questions. I think we have Omar and Tiffany so far, possibly Tomas, Susie, Ricardo. So uh, any takers wanna go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Okay. Um, first of all, wow, the information that you gave out was mind blowing. I mean, so my family, both my parents are from Oaxaca. So when you like mentioned that, and I was reading about how, I mean, there was a lot of 
um, like I saw there was like black troops in Oaxaca. Like, is that is that why like a lot of the South is still typically, I mean, like Mexico, you still have, you know, like the Northern end is you typically have a lot more like lighter skinned people and the, in the South, there's a lot more darker skin. Was that like part of the big relation to everything? Like while the country was essentially getting its independence, the people kind of stayed where they were and everything. Does that majority have to do with it? Or? Yeah, I mean, and that's also a matter of what the French <laughs> pointed to. I mean, they they understood and the way they depicted um, the resistance armies of Mexico was they they frequently refer to them as as Indian. They say, you know, we're, we're fighting Indians and, and blacks. Those are phrases that come up in the correspondence. And so that that's that was very much true in the in the resistance in Oaxaca, very, very much so. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I'm gonna ask my parents about that. Thank you. Very, very cool history that we're learning because I think a lot of the times, you know, people just um, know Cinco de Mayo, oftentimes <clears throat> confuse it with Mexican independence, or they'll at least know all oh, the Battle of Puebla, right? Um, but to know all the details and the intricacies and how how um, the intersectionality right between Mexico and the United States and the Civil War and um, the Black community who were also fighting for their own uh, independence and how it all just kind of intersects is so, so interesting. Um, let's go over to Tiffany. You ready with your question? Um, it's more like more like a comment. I couldn't really think of a question off of the top of my head. And I'm sorry if my, my daughter comes in, in and out in the background. Um, I just, the same topic right now that we're going through, I didn't know that a lot of um, African-Americans were a part of like the Mexico wars and stuff. And I thought it was significant that they saw it as like hope and triumph for them as a, as a, they could change the way things were in the US. Like it was like a part of the civil war and it's something that wasn't, it's not mentioned as at the beginning, but they saw it as a, as a starting point towards change, towards the movement of abolishing all these slavery laws. And my second comment is the whole Abraham Lincoln thing, how he's represented in Mexico. Like I didn't know that like a president of ours over here had such significance. Yes, baby shark to the people in Mexico as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Tiffany, it's it, those are really important important insights. And I mean, I didn't grow up knowing a lot of hardly any of this information, to be honest with you. And even today, when in when the you know when uh, El Grito is celebrated and the cry in Mexico City and it's very uh, inspiring, but those we've lost those histories of, of, of what this war was really about, I think, in some ways. And, and I think that's, if I understand your comments correctly, we forgot that this was a war against slavery. We forgot that this was a war against oppression. And we've kind of whitened, we've whitened the war. I'll just be candid with you. And I feel that the, the same process happens when you talk today about the French Revolution or even the American Revolution or a lot of, a lot of revolutions. We've really whitened them so that we don't really understand like what was at the bottom of them. I mean, a lot of people don't even know Jose Morelos uh, had African ancestry. Uh, and I'm just really, uh, I, I can't ever say I'm shocked because I didn't really understand that for many years. And I mean, even like when I talk to my students in Florida, I'll give you a parallel example, like take the Cuban um, uh, 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 liberation struggles. So when I talk to audiences of Cuban Americans in South Florida, and I talk about Anto you know, some of the generals, like say Antonio Maceo, and my students will say, we didn't know that he was part African. And no one ever told us that. We thought he was a white man. And I said, and I would say, that's a perfect metaphor for the way history is taught to us in this country. We're taught that everyone who did anything significant was a white man, and that we should just be grateful that we live in a country of enlightened white people, white leadership, right? But when we dig deeper into our histories, we realize, wow, this is not true. Uh, and the same thing is true in Central America. The same thing is true, believe me, throughout the world. I mean, a lot of the French people don't know 
that some of their leading generals were black men, uh, you know? And so, yeah, it, it's really, it, it's, it, these are really important um, observations, but I would say we have a chance to go back and think about things like Mexican independence and remember what people, again, I, the documents I've showed you from are not controversial. I mean, the first written document of Mexican independence says this is a war against slavery. It's, you know, and so I, I think part of it too, the last thing I'll say about this is that there's a lot of shame that, that Anglo-Americans have. I mean, you see this now coming out in this war against critical race studies, right? You know, they don't want us to think about 1619. They don't want us to know that Mexico abolished slavery long before the U.S. did. I can show you documents, for example, I found in my research where the U.S. government, congressmen, were trying to sue Mexico for the return of, of, of slaves because they were saying, hey, the Mexicans are stealing our property because so many Black people found sanctuary in Mexico. Uh, but these traditions of interracial solidarity continued continue to this day. I mean, again, if you go to Mexico City, uh, the name of Elizabeth Catlett, for example, uh, she's considered to be one of the great artists of Mexico of the 20th century. She was a Black woman, and she had to leave the United States because of the Red Scare, because she was connected to, uh, uh, to leftism. To, to, uh, she was accused of being a member of the Communist Party, but she resettled in Mexico and had an incredible artistic career. Langston Hughes, the great Black poet, urged Black people, move to Mexico. You'll find more freedom there than you will find in the United States. Um, and he knew this because his father became, was a successful black businessman in Mexico. You know, he, he could, you know, he, 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 I'm not, again, I'm not saying Mexico is flawless. Obviously it's a nation like any other nation that's full of flaws, right? But at the same time, there's, there's reasons I think we, that we've had our different heritages kind of almost stolen from us. And we were made to feel ashamed uh, when in fact we should be proud. That's why, I'm, that's why I actually like the, the, the hoopla around Cinco de Mayo because it gives people like us in this, in this class the chance for, for like a platform, a podium, you know, if only for a day, but we got to use it. It's kind of like MLK day in some ways, right? The commemorations around celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr can be trivial, we can make them watered down, we can make them meaningless, we can make it into a holiday, or we can use that day to really teach each other some real kind of movement history. I love that, I love that. And I think, you know, I just wanna to touch on that as well is that a lot of our histories have, have been erased and um, excluded, right, from the, from the official history books because we know the victors write, get to write history so that they can paint this picture of themselves that will uh, position them uh, in, in a place where is very beneficial for them. And so that is, that is part of our experience is to be erased or excluded from history. So that's one thing, but then when, when you really dig deeper into all these layers um, to know how much history there is between black and brown communities for like, centuries is so incredible. And I think that it's so important for us to learn that um, in black and brown communities and all communities, but especially in black and brown communities because we've oftentimes have fallen for the divide and conquer um, uh, strategy, right? So we often see each other as the other. They're them and we're us and we're, you know, we don't have anything to do with each other other than we're color, people of color. Uh, but in reality, we've, we've been fighting um, for our liberation together for centuries. And I think that we need to have more conversations about that. Um, and let's not forget that during um, the Spanish colonization and after there were millions of indigenous people who lost their lives due to disease and battle, um, you know, their human resources, their slaves, their indigenous slaves, you know, plummeted, the numbers plummeted. So they had to bring in 200,000 African slaves into what is now Mexico. 
So that Afro mestizaje started way, way back and sharing of culture started way, way back. Um, and so then we see all these other occurrences throughout history where, you know, we're coming together as black and brown peoples. Um, so it's just, I'm just so grateful that you're sharing this with us. Um, so we're gonna move on to our next question. Tomas, are you ready with your question? Uh, yeah, I guess I, I have kind of a question, comment. Um, I'm not like really good with history and stuff like that. And I, I kind of knew a little bit about like, um, like Mexico and America, uh, especially at that time. Uh, was, because I know Benito Juarez was friends with Abraham Lincoln. Was Benito Juarez the president during this time? Or I'm not sure, like, because that's the part that I don't know. Not quite the president, but yeah, because the, the leader, you know, one of the leaders of the resistance, right? Against the um, against the occupation, and definitely tried to rally the U.S. to to help uh, formally. But at that time, the U.S. was bogged down in the U.S. Civil War and couldn't really offer much support. Um, there's a wonderful painting of Juarez who is uh, connected to the struggle against the French, where he's kind of at the forefront. There's a Mexican flag. And he's kind of, you know, helping to rally people. So yeah, definitely a person who was considered to be one of the kind of official distinguished leaders of, of the resistance. Thank you, Tomas. Uh, Susie. Oh yeah, um, I had a question. So I didn't really catch what you had said about um, how you were saying like how you mentioned Mexico is not, you know, it's, they, they have flaws, just like how you said any other um, nation. But I know you mentioned that um, there's a reason why Mexico has not like uh, really bombed or invaded as many countries, like for example, as other nations. I know you, I, I just didn't catch the reason why you had said that. Yeah, well, it, it, it's, and it's a really important, um, observation you're making, it's part of the history of the nation. It's in the constitution. There's a very strong non-interventionist tradition within American legal and political institutions. And what I mean by this is that some nations learned from European uh, colonialism and other nations did not. A nation that did not learn uh, was the United States. Or if we did learn, we learned the wrong lessons. You know, one of the lessons is, you know, about power and, and, and wealth and greed. Um, in the 1813, in that first constituent assembly that was held in Mexico, that phrase, torture shall not be permitted, I think is a really, this is where that phrase becomes especially, especially important. Because from the beginning, you see that people realize the, the, the terrible things that were done to them by the Europeans. And they're trying to not forget those things. This is one of the reasons why I think the murals are very important. After the Mexican revolution in the 20th century, Mexico embarks upon this incredible period of mural creation in part because the people, you know, people then realize we're gonna forget, right? Time is a terrible, tool as far as you know forgetting things we have to remember where we came from we have to remember what was done to us because we don't want to do those things to other people we don't want to turn around and do what say the u.s americans were oppressed by the british right but then they turn around and oppress native american people and and they turn around and keep slavery going uh Mexic the mexican people had learned from these experiences up to that point you know up to 1810 and we're determined not to replicate those same mistakes. And so that history of non-intervention is a very important history. What I mean by non-intervention is we're not going to invade other nations, right? We're not going to take part in these, it takes a major you know, act for Mexico to embark upon a military invasion, right? Uh, even under the auspices of the United Nations. And people in the U.S., by the way, are very frustrated about this. They would love they would love Mexico to have a much bigger army so that they could direct it. Okay, At, let me give you one one other example. After World War II, actually in the closing weeks of World War II, a very important 
hemispheric meeting was held in Mexico City, or actually in Chapultepec, to be, to be specific. And the, the meeting was held to try to figure out, and it was all the nations of the Americas, every nation, except for Argentina, which often holds itself separate, right? That's another story. So every nation but Argentina convenes in Mexico at the end, at the closing weeks of World War II, for one reason. How do we avoid World War III? How do we create a, a new order that's not going to destroy the world? Because we just finished the second bloody war, World War. We've had the Holocaust. You know, we've had the atomic bomb. We've had all these horrific things. So how do we avoid World War III? That was the foremost question of that meeting, okay? There are three delegations that I want us to think about. There's the U.S. delegation that comes down. They're led by Southern white segregationists. There's the Haitian delegation, and there's the Mexican host delegation. This is kind of like the U.N., United Nations, before the, before the United Nations. In fact, the meeting is held right before the U.N. is formed in, uh, in San Francisco. Okay, So everyone's thinking about how are we going to create a new world where war is not uh, uh, threatening to destroy humanity. Okay. So the United States comes with a plan, right? The US loves to have plans. And so they come to Chipotle and they say, our plan is this, we're gonna avoid the next world war and the next war in this hemisphere by you countries like Mexico and Haiti and Chile. We want you to give us the power to deploy our troops to your countries if your freedom is imperiled. We want you to give us uh, a blank check, right? And the person who will decide when your freedom is in peril will be the president of the United States of America. That's the proposal the U.S. brought to the table in 1945. Now, just imagine you are the representative for Bolivia or Chile or Honduras. How would you respond to that proposal made by the United States of America? Just be honest. <laughs> You're shaking your head. Come on, you don't believe in the honesty of the United States, 1945, right? This is the counter proposal that was delivered by the Haitians and the Mexican delegation. And this gets to um, uh, this very important question that's been raised. The counter proposal was this the Haitians begin by saying that if you want to avoid they say, starting off, number one, Americans, we don't like your plan, right? But they say that to understand why World War II started, you have to start with racism. The Nazis launched this global war because they thought they were superior to everyone else. They thought they were superior even to white people in England and France, right? And so they launched this genocidal war because of racial superiority. So if we're going to stop World War III, y'all, We've got to strike against, against these ideas of white supremacy and racial superiority. So we're going to do, we're going to make two proposals. One is that every nation in the Americas must have laws that guarantee the, the equality of people within their nations and equally important, guarantee the equality of people between the nations. In other words, the smallest nation in the Americas should be no more uh, uh, equal than the largest nation. Okay. That was the Haitian proposal. And the Mexican delegation loved it. How do you think the American delegation reacted? To, again, be honest. This is a white supremacist country in Jim Crow. And I just showed you that sign, right? No Negroes, no Mexicans, no dogs allowed. That's the country that responded to the Haitian resolution. But guess what? The Mexicans came with their own plan the day later and they said, we love the Haitian plan. Yeah, we got to strike against racism and white supremacy and, and genocide and these things. But our dear brothers in Haiti forgot one thing. They're in Mexico and we have a constitution which enshrines the equality of women. What about women's rights? Shouldn't they be connected to, to anti-racism? And by this point, the Americans are going nuts. They're like, what is happening here? You know, they're like, and so th that's what I mean, these traditions. And, and again, it reminds us, you know, obviously today, women in Mexico are not equal to men. Women in the United States are not equal to men, right? But Mexicans in 1945 
are trying to honor these histories and legacies of the revolution and the war of independence. And they're saying that, that at least in a treaty, let's try to enshrine the rights of women and let's make sure that equality is enshrined within nations and between nations. And so, but again, y'all, these are the Mexicans and the Haitians who are on the cutting edge of freedom. And the US Americans are, I mean, they're trying to enforce white supremacy. They're not, they don't even allow black military veterans, men who sat, who were wounded in combat. Think about this, 1945, in this country, in the US, they don't even allow men, black men wounded in combat to vote in Mississippi or Texas. They don't even allow Mexican American soldiers who were killed in the Pacific in World War II. My great uncle served in the Pacific during World War II, but the founding of the, of the, of the, uh, the, the Chicano GI Forum is, is founded after World War II because Chicano parents can't even get their sons who were killed in World War II, they can't even get them buried in cemeteries because Anglos go nuts. They're like, we, we're not, you know, we, we respect your son's military service, but I'm sorry, but the, the, the city cemetery is for white people only. Well, where am I gonna bury my son who's killed to defend this country? Well, I'm sorry, you know, maybe somewhere, you know, right? So yeah, I, I apologize now because I'm starting to do the history, history profs ramble. But uh, I just want to, you know, again, remind us, you know, where these ideas for freedom come from. They come from Mexico. They come from Haiti. Uh, they come from Central America. You know, uh, they come from Africa. Uh, and, and those are the, the types of traditions. And um, uh, Veronica, as you were saying earlier, the intersections of those traditions are what I think is, is very important here as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, I do want to touch on, I'm so glad that you talked about the military veterans. Um, a, a story to look up, y'all, is uh, Fidel Sangoria. That's one of the more popular stories that came out of that time. But like even, even to be buried, there was segregation and white supremacy. Like even like there's no more life in the body and that we're still dealing with superiority, right? White, white supremacy, was this, which is nuts. Um, but that is a very true uh, part of history and and for some of us it might be very uncomfortable and it's like why do we have to focus on that because it's it's important to focus on that it's important to talk about these very real histories that happened and I want you all to think about this like like if you know a relationship right if something goes wrong in a relationship and there is an accountability there isn't an acknowledgement that yes I did something wrong we need to talk about it and get through it so that we can come out the other side and begin to heal and grow stronger from it, then it's just gonna continue picking away at your relationship until there is no more relationship, right? Um, so it's the same thing with in society. And this is the same thing where folks oftentimes just wanna say, why do we have to focus on that? Because these are the things that need to be acknowledged by everyone, including the descendants of the people who committed these atrocities. And to say, yes, I recognize that. I see that it happened and how what happened back then still affects us today because it very it does very very much it still affects us today and one of the reasons why it affects us today is because as a nation we are still stuck on not wanting to talk about those things and that's why they continue to surface and resurface and resurface and we continue to see all of these social injustices and all of these um protests and pushbacks because there's just this really you know um uh, I don't know what it is. It's just a, a, a way to just not wanting to look at that. And, and as uh, Dr. Ortiz was mentioning earlier, it's like, you know, people get upset when we talk about the 1619 project, people get upset when we bring these things to the table to talk about, because it's been very comfortable to just go ahead and sweep them un under the rug, right? But when we talk about them, it disturbs that comfort and people don't like that, but we have to do it because we've been disturbed, our comfort has been disturbed as oppressed communities for centuries. And we don't want, we're not trying to make it so that, okay, now you have to be okay. oppressed and disturbed for it's centuries. No, it's just, we just need to address these issues and work through them so that none of us 
have to live in a way that is oppressive so that we all of us can understand what true liberation is and so that we can live so we're, we're really in a there. together in a way that is that is good and that we can build on our common humanity so that's why we have to have these conversations um and i'm going to share that my partner and i were doing a um we we're doing a series of workshops for an entire high school staff um, and it's one thing to be training ethnic studies teachers who are ready for these conversations. And it, that's very different from addressing an entire staff where some of the folks in the room are definitely not ready for these conversations. And um, so it was probably our fourth or fifth workshop in where we disturbed some folks so much with these conversations that one of the teachers showed up to, uh, to that workshop wearing a MAGA hat on screen. And so that was just really disturbing to their colleagues, not to myself and my partner, because we're used to dealing with stuff like that all the time, unfortunately. Um, uh, but it was just really uh, traumatic and disturbing for the rest of the staff. Like the, this is somebody who's in front of our students, you know, and, and who knows what those at, at a school, which is primarily black and brown. So, you know, then there's concern for students and how they feel and they may not be feeling safe or, you know, there's just all these concerns that, that rise. And really it's just like, we get this constant pushback from him and another person of like, you know, just push back on everything that we're saying, no matter what. Um, so th those are the real issues that we have to deal with still. So to be able to hear histories um, from these different perspectives, right? And unpacking all these different layers is incredibly important. So I'm just really, really thankful for this conversation. I really, really am. Um, and so let's see, I think we have Ricardo who's next. Yeah, um, I just had a question. Um, I may have missed this. I mean, you may have uh, briefly mentioned it already, but I, I wasn't so sure. Um, but when the, uh, when the European imperialists or the French started to arrive into Mexico, um, Initially, were there was there a, like a divide between the Mexican population? Maybe like was there some people that may have received the news of you know, French arrivals with open arms, and maybe some people that were just vehemently opposed to it? And like, what was the relationship with that? Yeah, it's a really good question, Ricardo. Because you have to remember, you know, Mexico is still a very young nation at this time, and it's a nation that's just lost, you know, the upper part of its entire, you know landmass. And there were all there were all constant controversies during those years. If you look at at most nations, I'll back up a sec. Look at it, I would compare Mexico in 1862 with the United States in the early 19th century, say about 30, 40 years after the American Revolution. Um, the British invade the United States in 1812 because they know that the US is a very divided society, right? They know that there's some Americans who are going to welcome the British with open arms. And in fact, that happened. And the British actually marched right into Washington, D.C. and burned the capital to the ground. And it was really the British only lost that war because they were tied down in Jamaica, in India, and other parts of the world. Mexico didn't have those advantages. And they did. it was a divided society. There were people who accepted the French, especially and again, I mentioned Cuernoderismo because that's a key to me. And I wanna get back to something that was said earlier. We're never anti-white because we have whiteness in our own families, right? We're never anti-black. We have blackness in our families, all of us do, indigenous blood and histories, right? And that's why I take so much strength from my great grandmother, Mia Cuernodera, because she respected European religious spiritual traditions, right? She incorporated them into her, into her practice. Um, and that's why the Mexican countryside united so heavily against the French invasion, whereas a lot of people within cities um, either kind of gave up because the French had so much overpowering military strength. Again, you have to remember the French come over with an enormous army. It's highly trained. It's considered to be probably the, the, the best army on the European continent at that point. And so there are some people who welcome the French with open arms. There's religious reasons too, right? There's, there's Christianity. And again, I mentioned the Corinthianismo because that's not just Christianity. That's a blend of all those different traditions. 
So uh, yes, and you see the divisions will, will continue after 1862, even after the French are expelled. And we see these manifested in the years leading up to the Mexican Revolution in the early 20th century, right? It takes a long time for nations to really come together. And again, I would think that, again, I kind of like us to think about maybe this is where the US and Mexico are good parallel examples because I mean, the U.S. is fighting the, the, you know, at that point, the bloodiest civil war in history, almost a century after the revolution, after its own revolution. That is, the U.S. hasn't even really come together by 1861 without completely, you know, falling to pieces. And so Mexico is a very, I mean, this is why I think, Ricardo, getting back to your question, why we haven't had as many really good, um, at least in English, you know, histories of this time period, because it is a confusing time period in the sense that there are many different shifting alliances. And, but there are some moments when people do come together. And I, I wanna emphasize again, these states or uh, uh, places where the French never really could, could pacify. And, and by pacify, I mean, you know, essentially dominate. Um, Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Okay, I think we have Anaive next. Are you, are you able to Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay. So I had a question. So like, after like learning about all this and how like women in the war and how African Americans were also involved in the war, um, how do you like, because I, you obviously teach up in Florida, how do like students react? Do they like react like towards like a negative side or are they like oh yeah no this didn't happen or trying to change the type of path or like be like oh no this happened in the war and trying to like I guess like I don't know how to describe it like deny what you're trying to, to say or what you were talk talking about yeah all of the above I mean that's why I love being a teacher and being a historian I mean because I grew up in a society where people lied all the time about like how we got to where we got to what really pushed me into becoming a historian was, you know, I was a soldier in U.S. Special Forces in Central America in the mid 80s. I mean, all my people at all, all we knew growing up was war, right? One war after another. And I just got to Central America in the mid 80s and I started getting educated by people. It's like, they're, they'd be like, you know, why are you here? You know, in Colombia, Honduras, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, my country says it's about freedom. And they're like, we don't need you to bring freedom to us. What are you talking about? You know, and we have these really interesting discussions. And I'd see these murals of people like Augusto Sandino. And I didn't know who he was. And then I started reading up on him. I'm like, my gosh, you know, it took me a while, but I started thinking, you know, <laughs> Paul, you're on the wrong side of this whole thing. Um, but again, it took me a long time to really come to that viewpoint. So now when I teach students or I talk to communities, I do a lot of like work in anti-racist workshops. Um, I do a lot of, in the sense, the Black Lives Matter movement kind of resurged. I've been doing a lot of workshops on anti-Black racism uh, within Latino communities uh, in South Florida and Chicago uh, and other places. Um, and, but yeah, to get back to your question, I get all of the above. Initially, when I taught at UC Santa Cruz, um, and I worked with a lot of undocumented students from Mexico, and I would just give the piece about the Mexican War of Independence and the struggle against slavery. And I would have Mexican students coming in my office hours and just in tears. And they were infuriated too. And they would say, you know, I grew up in Mexico. We never learned any of this. We never learned we have these proud traditions of emancipation. No one ever taught us this, like, why not? And, and there was so much anger and passion and kind of determination. We're not gonna allow the next generation to be so miseducated as we were. Um, I'll, let me share one, one more anecdote with you, which is very painful to, to share, but um, I mentioned I do work in South Florida, where there are you know, a lot of Cuban American communities in Miami-Dade. And when I started teaching, doing workshops there, I showed that slide that showed um, the Europeans torturing and burning indigenous people alive and branding African people with, with the, the slave uh, brands, right? And my students there were incredulous. They were shocked. They were like, we were taught down here 
that the Spanish were kind colonialists, that it was the French and the British and the Dutch who were brutal and savage and sadistic. We were taught that the Spanish were just trying to bring religion and civilization and they were very gentle with us. And I said, my God, <laughs> who taught you that? I mean, you know, centuries of the Cuban liberation wars against the Spanish will teach you otherwise. Well, but they didn't know those histories. They didn't even know their own people's histories. They knew who Ronald Reagan was. They know who George Bush was, but they didn't know who Jose Marti was. They didn't know who Antonio Maceo was, you know, and, and so that, but again, when I put myself back into their shoes, when I'm 15 or 18 years old, I didn't know that material. I mean, my gosh, that's why I love being a historian. Um, I was so much into the, the, like the Chicano punk movement in the early eighties, because I was like, wow, this is the first music I listened to where people told the truth. And, and, and that, that how they talk about how corrupt the society was. Because I grew up in a society that had a lot of problems, y'all. And when you try to talk about them, people would say, oh, don't complain. You know, it's worse in other countries, right? That's like, huh, that doesn't really help people here. I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm, uh, you know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah, that's why I love being a teacher is that, and I can learn from my students too. And um, yeah, you know, um, we do have one last question. I'm going to have Ernesto ask his question because I think it's a really popular question and we are at time. So we'll try to keep this brief. Uh, go for it, Ernesto. Uh, yeah, I just noticed <clears throat> at least um, recently uh, uh, more and more people are uh, highlighting this, but do you have like a theory or idea why like the holiday Cinco de Mayo became so commercialized, so it's like capitalized? Like, how did the cultural appropriation, like, kind of take over? Well, you know, it goes back to the 19th century. It's, it's something that you can, you realize people are getting together. They, and, and, you know, let's be honest, you know, libations were part of the early celebrations, too. You know, people drank. And so it became something that, that beer companies realized, hey, you know, we can make a lot of money off of this. And so there's a commodification. Now, I'm not an expert on that, by the way. So I encourage you to read uh, uh, Professor uh, Batista uh, Hayes, Hayes' work on that process, because he talks about how the, the day is, is, is kind of incrementally commodified. Um, and I think now, again, I'll go back to the opportunities I think that we have. And so I've been invited to give talks at, at events that are clearly kind of like these raucous celebrations. And I'll just get up there and, and try to, to give as much of the history as I can. And then some of the people are like, you could tell they don't really care, you know, because they're there to drink and have a good time. But then some people will stop and say, wow, like, I just thought this was a day to drink, you know, and, and I'm talking about like, I'm talking about Chicanos, I'm talking about people who like, but again, if, I, if I'm honest, that would have been me, my 18 year old self would have been there with, with the, you know, right? Um, we have to be patient. I guess that's what I'm saying as organizers and as teachers, we have to meet people where they're at, not where we want them, you know, to be. And so, you know, I, a lot of, you know, a lot of my friends, my, in my age group, I just, you know, turned 57, will say, you know, on single to my man. Ortiz, man, I'm not going to go out. You're crazy. I'm just going to stay home. I don't want to hear anything. I want to be cut off. I don't want to be uh, pissed off, you know, by these Anglos. That's what a friend told me earlier today from California, right? And I'm like, no, brother, that's not the right answer. The, the right answer is get out there, mingle, mix with people, talk to them, you know, spread the, you know, spread the truth, you know, as, as best as we can. Um, because the commodification is going to happen no matter what you and I do, frankly. It's just going to continue. We're never going to stop people from the cultural appropriation part, but we can educate them. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Um, folks, I also did drop in the chat a link to a podcast I was listening earlier this morning, and they did touch on that point about the commodification and how it ended up being that um, these beer um, industries ended up like funneling money into um, 
making Cinco de Mayo into what it is because there was that opportunity to make money. So listen to it. It's not a very long podcast, but it's very interesting. Um, but with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, a million thank yous to Dr. Ortiz here for um, just being an amazing historian, period. And then for taking time, of course, out of your busy schedule, especially on a busy day like today for historians such as yourself to be here and share space with us and to um, share the truth and share all perspectives of, of history when it comes to this particular holiday. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for yeah. being with us. And students, yeah. you already know what to do. Go ahead and unmute, say your goodbyes and your thank yous to our guest speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, so you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.